Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, Get Guaranteed Message Delivery with Jitterbit's Message Queue Service. I'm Kunal Mehta, Director of Product Marketing at Jitterbit, and I'm joined today by Keith Rigg, who is the Vice President of Technical Services at Jitterbit. I would like to start by thanking all of you for your time today. Before we begin the webinar, just a reminder that you can ask your questions at any point during the webinar by using the Q&A button on your Zoom window. We will try and answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar, but you don't have to wait uh, for your questions uh, till the end. So as we go through the content and you have a question in mind, feel free to put that in the Q&A section. With that, let me hand over to Keith to kick us off. Thank you, Kunal. Um, and just to echo your, your sentiment, big thank you to all webinar attendees for joining us today. Uh, it's an exciting product launch and I'm pleased to be here to take you through the, the presentation um, and hopefully by the end of which you'll know everything you need to know about the Jitterbit message queue. Uh, so with that being said, let's make uh, a start. Okay, so the way we do business has changed and continues to, to do so. Um, advances in technology continue to accelerate, AI being a, a great example of that. I'm sure you've seen many posts and, and articles recently relating to OpenAI and ChatGPT. Um, that combined with tougher trading conditions, an increase in competition, macroeconomic pressures, and it's clear to see what the, the drivers are behind uh, an increase in demand for solutions that, uh, that enable digitization and uh, increased levels of automation. Uh, it's worth pointing out, though, that an increase in the number of systems in your application landscape leads to an increase in complexity, and that then, in turn, leads to a greater need for robust integration solutions. And at the same time, we're charged with delivering best-in-class experiences for both employees and customers, anybody, in fact, that interacts with the solutions you deploy within your organization. So the drivers for change are clear, which in turn has led to organizations prioritizing automation initiatives. And of course, as we've just outlined, there's an increased use of AI as a subset of those hyper automation initiatives. So at the same time, though, it's, it's very relevant to acknowledge the shift from legacy and monolithic systems to a best of breed approach. And that then again underscores the the importance of a robust integration solution, the more systems you have in play, the more integration requirements that there are. And that's somewhere that Jitterbit is uniquely placed to, to help. Uh, so really in terms of hyper automation, you know, what, what is it and, and how do you achieve it? It's possible when you have the combined uh, capability set of a number of technologies that are working together as one. The, the aim being that you achieve a high degree of what I call adaptive automation within your organization. So it's not static, it's not fixed, it's situational and it can adapt to the needs of the business, but also the particular context within which those transactions are being executed. But in order to, to achieve that goal, um, it requires a number of things. From a senior level within the organization, you need executive sponsorship. Um, often you'll need significant investment of resources and that's both time and cost. Um, and then from our perspective, one key challenge that we often see uh, customers facing and we we engage to, to help them overcome is the challenges of making all of those technologies work together as one, because of course, you can't really go to one vendor and buy a hyper automation solution. Um, you might invest in a number of different technologies and then you're faced with uh, bringing those technologies together to work as, as one. And that's where Jitterbit now has evolved into an organization that can at least help you with a, a large part of, of that problem. So in terms of um, our own evolution, many of you will, will know Jitterbit as existing customers of ours as uh, a trusted and leading uh, iPaaS and, and APIM provider. But we've evolved from being an iPaaS focused business to a leading hyper automation solution provider. Um, and we've achieved that for a mix of, of two things primarily. One is organic growth and uh, internal innovation from our products and engineering functions. But the other strand or the, the other traction I say is acquisition activity of which we've completed four strategic acquisitions in the last uh, 18 months. So the, the building blocks really uh, that we have now on the on the screen, iPaaS is the integration backplane. It's the base layer upon which most of the things um, leverage. 
EDI uh, was already a part of our solution set, but was strengthened for a, an acquisition um, some time ago. API Manager has been around for five years, so it has been a very important part of the platform in terms of the event-driven uh, capability and also the API publishing capability. And then most recently, we've invested heavily in low-code application development, so the ability to put a presentation layer or low-code app on top of the API um, services that we publish, which are underpinned, of course, by things like EDI and the, the integration capabilities. So you can then start to see how Jitterbit is no longer just an, a, an iPaaS and APIM vendor. It's taking quite a significant portion of the hyper-automation puzzle and, and solving that for you and allowing you then to make more progress with your, your various initiatives. Once you embark on the journey, though, it becomes clear very quickly that management and control of the of the automated communication is a critical success factor. If you don't have a good handle on that, you're going to have failure scenarios within your organization. If you take a before and after look, when humans are involved in manual processes, yes, human, uh, human error can creep in and you'll have errors because of that, but people can course correct and, and you know, resolve issues on the fly. Whereas if it's a system to system, machine to machine, automated flow, it can fail silently or there can be an inability to self-heal or to, to recover from failure scenarios. So it's really important then that you have a system in place that can handle that flow of, of communication across these, these systems in your organization. And obviously once you do increase the level of automation, um, you're going to have more systems in play, more communications flowing throughout the business automatically, and invariably more mission critical payloads traversing through those systems. So having a robust platform at the core of that with advanced technologies, working together as one is, is critical to your, your ultimate success. Okay, and so in terms of how we do that, um, Jitterbit's MQ service offers at its heart guaranteed message delivery or as I often refer to it, message delivery assurance. So it's really giving the business that assurance that business continuity is going to be maintained. You know, there isn't going to be an interruption to service or some sort of breakdown in communication as you set about those, those efficiency gains and you'll deliver those through um, optimizing and automating processes. You want to make sure that that error rate is low and the, you know, the whole thing works seamlessly as much as, as possible. So in terms of the value proposition from a Jitterbit perspective or, or Harmony, it's really down, down to three things at a high level. The technology is embedded as a building block at the foundation level of the platform. So it's embedded, it's built in. It's not an extra uh, technology that you need to learn, maintain. Uh, you don't have that extra run cost. So you have a lower TCO. You have reduced complexity. We're abstracting away that complexity and simplifying the use at the point of consumption. So you don't have to be a, an MQ specialist. You don't have to worry about that being highly available and resilient and then maintaining that tech stack separately. It's a, an, a bed, an embedded module within the platform for which you're already a subscriber. And we take care of the, the management and maintenance and the support of that on your behalf. So you get a turnkey solution with the power of that technology at the, the heart of, uh, of the platform. In terms of consumption itself, you would interact with it as a user through Cloud Studio using a dedicated connector, which knows how to get the best out of, of Jitterbit MQ as a, a technology. And then in terms of administering the technology as a whole, you would go to the relevant module in the web management console and configure and, and manage and monitor your, your MQ activities there. So you don't need to go to uh, an external system to, to maintain your, your MQ infrastructure. So at this point now, it's good to, to do says a deep dive, but it's more of just a step through as to how an MQ works in general, but also specifically how it would work uh, by default within, within Jitterbit. So if you think about the schematic that's on screen right now, and we're indicating that we're going to receive some messages from a source system. It doesn't really matter what the source system is. Could be Salesforce, could be SAP, could be an ITSM system, could be anything for, for that matter. We're showing that we're pulling um, the message from the source system, but it could actually be a push from the source system. It could be coming through the API gateway and then into the integration plane. Uh, it could be us using our listener framework and absorbing a stream of messages in, in true real time. Or in this scenario, the simplest method is for us to be pulling. Uh, be, it could be on a schedule or a trigger, but in any case, we end up with 
a set of, of messages that we want to, to process. So in Cloud Studio or Design Studio, um, you would have those messages present themselves as the, the source system into the source system connector. That's the first step. The second step then would be that you would treat the Jitterbit MQ service as an intermediary target. So instead of it being point to point and going from source to, to final target, you're going from source to JBMQ and then from JBMQ to the final target or targets. So we're following a loosely coupled architecture here and that decoupling adds a lot of value in, in terms of the architecture and the longevity of your solutions. But if you bear with me for a second, we're coming from the source via whatever source system connector is applicable to your scenario onto the MQ connector. We're then depositing safely those messages onto the MQ service. And at this point now, we're able to guarantee the delivery of those messages to the target or targets because we have a persistence layer which isn't going to lose the message until we confirm receipt of those messages, those payloads at the desired destination. So from this point forwards, we, we can then ensure that that guaranteed delivery uh, pattern. So then we then on the far side now are using the MQ connector to pull or, or consume or, or get the messages from the uh, queue or queues. We're pushing to the target system via the target system connector, depending on what system it is. Um, and assuming that we get a positive receipt, a confirmation that the message had reached the final target or targets, we would then go back to the MQ and explicitly acknowledge the, the receipt of that message, at which point it would be purged from the queue. If though there were an error, um, be it a technical error or a functional error in delivering the message or messages to the target, we would do a negative acknowledgement, which would mean the message or messages wouldn't be purged from the queue and would be then picked up in the next batch. So normally you would be approaching this um, in a scenario where you would maybe take a batch of 100 or 1,000 messages. You would run through those multi-threaded for performance reasons, and you would be aiming to have a high percentage of those successfully delivered and therefore acknowledged. Or in some cases, depending on the scenario, you might have a, a small number which error. And it could be a temporary network issue. The system that you're connecting to downstream could have an issue. Could be a governor limit could be a 429 type type uh, situation. Those short-lived issues can be recovered from quite quickly. So in the next batch, those messages would get through and reach the final destination. So that's the standard pattern and mechanism for ensuring guaranteed delivery. In terms of um, MQ use cases, or maybe better stated as capabilities, we've already had JBMQ in the field uh, internally, uh, we had it in preview mode for quite a while. Then it was in a private early adopter beta, then a public beta. And now it's out there with a number of strategic uh, customers who are operating at quite a large scale. So what we've been able to do is to identify the top eight most commonly asked for capabilities, which are often combined against different functional or technical use cases. So in terms of the, the first one we've spoken about, guaranteed delivery, um, normally achieved through explicit acknowledgements, but it can also be paired with dedicated retry queues. We can talk about that more in, in detail uh, afterwards if we want to. Um, oops, sorry. Message throttling, um, which is really the ability to guard against back pressure, use the MQ service as a buffer, have the ability to ingest records or messages from the front end at a higher rate than we can actually deposit them at the back end. Uh, and avoid overrunning the backend systems if there's a, a, a difference in the ability to uh, consume messages at the back end versus the, the speed at which they're being emitted and absorbed at the, the front end, absorbed at the, the front end. Back pressure, it allows that kind of um, ability to cope with peaks in, in demand and, and really just have that smooth ebb and flow effect through the, the, the integration uh, landscape. Uh, in some scenarios, you'll have a consumer, um, the, the consuming system, the client at the front end may be hitting uh, an API uh, and the back end could be an expensive long running process. That might be because of the complexity of the business rules and the transformation logic in the integration workflow, or it could be because of the speed of the execution at the back end system. Let's say it's a, a long running SAP job, for, for example. Now, in some scenarios, it might be the right thing to do to leave the API as a synchronous request response API, but the consumer is going to be hanging on the wire for quite a while whilst the um, interactions at the back end complete before the response can be served up. So 
quite often what you'll see when that scenario occurs is that you'll switch to an asynchronous pattern. You'll send the payload in through the API gateway. In our case now, we would push that to the queue as quickly as possible. Once it's on the queue, respond back with a 202, which is a success accepted code, and often with correlation ID or a tracking ID. And then that allows you to check back later to see if the processing is complete and can you get the payload. Um, so you can leave the onus on the client to check back at a sensible time frame and then see if the job is complete. Or better still, you can configure Jitterbit then to use a webhook and to actually go back and alert the consumer, the, the calling tier, that the job is now complete. And then they can then come back with that, that unique ID, the tracking ID, the correlation ID to go get the particular payload. So it allows uh, for a, a, a decoupled asynchronous pattern and the consuming system isn't held up waiting for a response that could take a, a while to come back. So quite a nice one to, to look to. I'm going to skip through some of the rest of these now in the interest of time, but you've got things like message tracking, which allows you to have a sort of an audit trail, a series of breadcrumbs that show you how far a message was able to get through the, the, uh, the, the automation uh, workflows that you've built. We've got things like dynamic routing, which can be driven off of um, things like format or content type, object, and by object, I mean the, the entity, the model. So it could be an invoice, a sales order, an account, a contact, a contact, and then things like versions so that you can make sure that um, your integrations can be multi-version aware and the API can then be forwards and backwards compatible. And if you do release services to internal customers or even external customers, they can be on different versions of the API or different versions of the automation framework. Um, and it's not as though you're going to force everybody forwards or cause regression issues or, or breaking changes. So a more kind of dynamic way of, of building your, your integration workflows. Message prioritization is really down to things like routing message based on business criticality, introducing the concepts of quality of service rules. So you can have queue jumping and fast tracks and stuff like that if you have high value orders coming through the business, you want them to reach the destination quicker. At just the time you've got a high volume of low value messages, you can kind of, you know, allow for that, that multi, uh, multi-lane multi quality of service type situation to, to safeguard. Uh, payload encapsulation or, or encryption. The way most MQs work and the way our message queue works is that it's a message and a message or maybe better said as a message with an envelope within an envelope. The message within the envelope is the payload, the thing that you ultimately want to deliver to the target or you want to, to act on. Um, the envelope would carry things like the metadata, the routing keys, the things that allow you to identify the type of payload within and also where it should be dynamically rooted to and, and what treatment should be um, delivered to that particular message. So it's really about driving adaptive behavior and, and allowing you to have that uh, branching logic and, and decision tree logic in, in your integrations. Uh, and optionally, you can optionally, sorry, you can encrypt the plain text message. It's encrypted in flight and at rest. But if you were to look at it in, say, the um, the operation log, if you were to write it to the operation log, it would be in plain text. But you could optionally choose to encrypt that, in which case then you'd see the message, but you wouldn't be able to decipher it as a person. The system could decipher, decipher it, obviously, with the decrypt keys. Push queues are really the ability for us to listen to poll um, a queue or queues. And when a message is presented to that queue, then take an action and push that message to most often uh, a REST delivery point, so a HTTP endpoint. That in our scenario would be an API you've published on the API manager that then would um, initiate or invoke an integration workflow, a series of operations, if you will. So it's moving more towards an event-driven architecture. So it's true real-time and event-driven architecture as opposed to near real-time, which is what we do currently with the, the API manager. So top eight use cases, um, the four in green there, the ones that I've spoken in most detail about the rest I've just touched on. Um, if you do want to go into any of these use cases in more detail, we can do that in the Q&A or we can do that offline and talk to you one-on-one uh, -on -one with regards to your specific use cases and any sort of business challenges you're, you're facing where you might see, see good use for this. Um, and then in terms of trying to bring this to life and giving you um, a better idea as to how it can all work together in a, in a more um, complete and enterprise setting, we have a reference architecture um, on screen. Let me just turn my 
pointer on so that I can spotlight some stuff. So what we have here um, is a reference architecture. It's um, a large client that we, we have, uh, a multinational third-party logistics company. They have a high volume of mission critical clients, around 100 plus and clients. Um, because of the line of business they're in, the transactions flowing through their system, by and large, are orders coming in from various uh, channels or, or web shops from consumers who have been through a, a checkout process, you know, paid paid money for for goods and services, and then understandably expect those products or services to to find their way to uh, to, to the destination address. So usually their their pl place of home. So what we discovered when we started to put this high level design together was that of their 100 plus clients, they broadly uh, fit within one of four persona buckets. So we've got them on the left hand side here. So we have the API uh, persona bucket, the EDI bucket, legacy and direct to, to app. So the API persona are the larger, more mature organizations or the younger organizations that don't have tech debt or legacy systems and are looking for an API first approach. So they're quite happy to communicate over a modern REST API or another form of modern API and to send their data in via that mechanism. And quite often they've also got the capability to give um, an API to the free PL provider so that they can then return messages back in the other direction. So a more modern standards-based mature uh, way of working. EDI um, been around for a long time. Obviously, it's more prevalent in certain industries, especially in the um, retail sector, but but also in in other sectors and, and industries. Uh, and here, this would be formal EDI standards, quite often delivered over AS2 as a transport mechanism. But it's really the ability to deal with those sort of mandated um, standards, which are often part of a you know supply chain or, or uh, contracts of of, uh, of supply for for goods and services. Uh, contract so you have no choice you have to do it if you want to work with especially a lot of the the supermarkets uh, it's quite quite important legacy is more um, for backwards compatibility and so that you're able to to span the full spectrum of of clients so things like um moving plain text files around through secure file transfer managed file transfer type activities and then direct to app is really a catch-all for the online web shops so the shopify's Big commerce, WooCommerce, various order management systems, and what we'd be doing there is using uh, an array of our application-specific connectors to connect directly into those web shops and, and channels and absorb those messages out. Depending on the the trigger criteria, some cases it can be push, in other cases it's pull or or it's triggered, but we can absorb those messages. And as you can see, uh, there would you know there'd be a spread of clients across these four personas, um, and you can see that each of those personas is mapped onto essentially uh, an ingress pathway. So it's a, a conduit through which the messages can find their way into the Jitterbit Harmony platform. And from that point on, they can start to um, take benefit from all of the capability we, we touched on. So if it's API or, or EDI, they come through the API and EDI gateways respectively. If it's legacy or direct to app, they come straight into the, the agent runtime, be that the cloud agents or the private agents. In any case, the API, the gateways and the runtime only really do as instructed by the design time projects that you build in the, the design uh, experience, be that Cloud Studio or Design Studio. If you look at the box here, which I'm circling, um, the projects box, we have then three separate boxes within, uh, within the blue dotted lines. I'll start on the left-hand side here and talk about the edge projects. So these projects, as you can see, we have four, one for each of the personas. So there's an API, an EDI, and um, the, the file transfer and the direct app. Now, these edge projects are really concerned with just border control. Um, it's ingress, egress communication. So it's kind of the, it's holding true to the principle of sole responsibility. It's, a lot, it's trying to keep the footprint of these projects as small and as lean as possible. There's a, a very small attack surface. They can be easily performance tuned and security hardened because they have a very simple and sole reason for existing. And that's to verify that the message coming in is from an approved source. So it's that origin um, and it's a known origin one that we're prepared to accept messages for. We're then validating the authenticity of the message and the validity of the message as well. 
And as soon as possible, we're pushing it onto to the MQ. And if you think back to earlier in the presentation, once it's on the MQ, it's then job done. It's it's in a safe place. It's persisted, and we can guarantee delivery uh, to the final target from that point forwards. So these guys on the edge are really perimeter projects that just police the inflow and outflow of messages. Um, we don't go to the core projects or the backend systems directly. It's this loosely coupled architecture. So these edge projects push the messages to the message queue, and then the uh, core projects, as they're called, um, are pulling from the message queue, and in this case, going to the warehouse management system, which is kind of the ERP system of the third part of logistics world. So a bit about the core projects. For each of the clients, the end clients, um, <clears throat> what we've done is build a gold build that this project would be a larger project which embodies more business logic. So this is where you'd have multiple integration workflows built up of a, uh, you know, a series of, of operations chained together in whatever way is necessitated by the business rules. But that goal build then ensures a consistent high quality deployment to each and every end client. Each end client would have its own individual project, which is born from this goal build. And that then allows us to uh, isolate one client's traffic and data from another. Bear in mind, you know, Jitterbit is a multi-centered SaaS platform, but this is a single customer of Jitterbit, then providing services to their end clients. So it's multi-tenancy within an end client organization, not just multi-tenancy at, at a Jitterbit level. So you'd have several of these uh, client projects, which then would pull from the relevant queues on the MQ, route the messages to the warehouse management system. It listens to the outbound queues on the WMS, and then would push back to the queue and then the corresponding edge project would return the message back in the other direction to complete the circle. So that's kind of the edge and the perimeter, the inflow outflow and the back end core interactions. Um, finishing off with the top two lay layers, we have the innovation layer. What this particular client chose to do was to build um, an intellectual property API, which was then a set of value added services that allow them to differentiate themselves from their competition when they're bidding for uh for, for work and uh, with you know through tender processes with potential clients they could either have a competitive edge and win uh, against their competition more easily because of this value-added intellectual property layer which goes above and beyond the the bare minimum of the the free pl services there are additional value adds that make them an easier organization to interact with a higher degree of automation more transparency key business metrics being available on demand, for example, uh, or it allows them to charge more for the for the contract, which then is, is more margin and profit for the organization. So uh, they were quite keen on that, and this whole platform and the architecture allowed them to, to realize that goal. Uh, and to the right of that is uh, a health project or a health and, and monitoring project. And what this project is doing primarily, uh, when any of these core or edge projects execute, if there were to be any warnings or errors, um, we have a, a universal um, reusable error handling um, function that we plug in in the right places, and it then offboards the errors or warnings to the relevant queues on the MQ. And then this health project monitors those queues, and then we'll do, depending on conditionally, it will look at the error, the criticality, the system um, has understanding of the context and, and what to do. Um, and it will then do a number of things. It will offboard to an observability platform for analytics. It can create incidents in an incident management system. And if need be, it can alert different resolver groups or customer services agents through a mix of uh, teams and, and Slack. So call to actions often pointing back to uh, an incident in an, in an incident system or uh, maybe a, a, you know, a, a log in, in the observability platform to aid the, the resolution. Um, and then more recently as well, uh, this was kind of the first the first iteration of this build, and it advanced uh, into a second phase not too long ago, where we overlaid App Builder, our low code app development platform, to put a an end user uh, no code application on top of this. And when there are certain um, data issues or non technical issues that aren't resolvable through self healing routines within this sol solution. Uh, we actually create a task in, in App Builder um, and then route it to the customer services representatives who then step in, correct the issue, allow the, the message to be replayed, and then ultimately it gets where it's going. So then we have a zero 
uh, error rate and, and it's a, a never fail solution. So even when humans do step in by exception and it's on a very small uh, number of the overall messages, it, it's done in a no code manner. They don't need to come into the integration solution. So it's that kind of self-service model by the business, but by exception with a high, uh, high success rate overall. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, hopefully that gives some color as to where you can take the platform in its present day. And of course, it's continuing to, to advance. But once you put Jitterbit MQ in the center of this, combined with things like the listener framework, app builder as a presentation layer, and you start to modernize the overall approach, you can achieve some quite in, impressive results. And for those of you who are longer standing customers, um, maybe you still think of Jitterbit as um, an integration solution or an ETL solution. And maybe you've not even fully embraced the API manager, but if you combine uh, the full capability set, there's quite a lot of powerful, interesting use cases you can, can execute against. So um, that's pretty much everything in terms of the, the walkthrough, just to maybe recap on the, the key benefits of using MQ or message queues within Harmony. It's simplification at the point of consumption. We're abstracting away the complexity. It's a lower TCO. You don't have the, the overhead of dealing with that tech stack uh, within your, your IT landscape. It's that core ability to guarantee message delivery. It's a, an ability to cope with a, an increase in, in the volume of transactions and doing that um, actually with increased performance and um, obviously at the same time doing it securely. So uh, with that, I'll hand over. Thank you so much, Keith, for that great overview of Jurabit's MQ service.